Hello and welcome everybody to today's seminar at the International Inequality Peace Institute at the London School of Economics. My name is Asif Wood. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology and together with my colleague Fiona Gujescu, I have founded a doctoral research group on inequality and social mobility. I'm very pleased to be chairing today's seminar titled The Social Life of Inequality, Why Unequal Countries Stay That Way. Today's event is part of the Opportunity and Mobility Seminar Series. It launches the III's new research theme titled Opportunity, Mobility and the Intergenerational Transmission of Inequality. Today's speakers are Dr. Jonathan Mice and Ziu Li. Dr. Mice is an Assistant Professor of Sociology at Boston University and a visiting fellow at the III. His work explores why so many people in the West hold meritocratic explanations of poverty and wealth in contexts of growing economic inequality. His research also explores the cultural and cognitive causes of the disconnect between meritocratic perception and unequal reality and the political consequences thereof. Ziu Li is a PhD candidate in sociology. She is affiliated with the Maurice Halbach Center and Claire Zee at the University of Lille. She combines approaches from the sociology of education, the sociology of quantification, and the sociology of elites and economic anthropology. Her research explores the transaction of symbolic capital through rankings in selective examinations. This event is a meeting rather than a webinar. This means ideally we all see each other and have a more interactive event. May I ask our audience to please turn on your videos if that's possible for you and please keep yourselves muted for now. Our speakers will present for one hour and there will be a Q&A session after the presentations. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function and ask your question directly or paste it into the chat. Please state your name and affiliation in both cases. I will now hand over to our speakers. Thank you and enjoy the event. All right, so big thanks to, uh, to Asif, to Fiona, Paolo, uh, for for the invitation, really, for uh, uh, for speaking here and and for organizing this uh, this symposium, it's really it's it's great to be back, e even though it's um, briefly and and very very much virtually. Um, but to be back at the III, where I worked for for two years, very stimulating years, and where some of the research program that I'm going to be presenting on today uh, originates. Uh, so what I'll be uh, doing is um, uh, there's basically two parts to my presentation uh, today. Um, I'll be offering sort of what is my diagnosis of the current political moment in countries like uh, the UK and the US where, where we see high levels of inequality, um, uh, but at the same time, um, those levels of inequality have produced only limited public consternation. And then um, I'll be uh, presenting some implications for how we do research on uh, beliefs about mobility, opportunity, uh, and inequality. Um, I um, very much look forward to your questions and your comments. I plan on speaking for about 40 minutes, um, and so there should be, should be ample opportunity for, for conversation. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, jump right in. So um, uh, this graph shows the trend in income inequality for the UK over the past 80 years. Uh, that's based on calculations by uh, Steve Jenkins and uh, the late Tony Atkinson, let's see. So across the Western world, income inequality started growing some, some 40 years ago, uh, in most countries peaking in the 1990s and 2000s, at which point those countries had effectively returned to a, a level of inequality that we really haven't seen since the uh, Great Depression. So this you know, very dramatic rise in inequality uh, hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, uh, scholars like Tony Atkinson and, and Sandy Jenks in the US, for instance, have been documenting these very trends since their very start in the 1970s and, and 1980s. And you know, it may have taken a while, but certainly today, um, uh, this kind of research has received a lot of attention in, in the press, uh, in, in political conversations, in sort of public debate as well. So you could conclude, as, as this cartoon does, that inequality is, is sort of squarely uh, on the public agenda. But while well, this cartoon may sort of mirror what, what is our perception of a growing salience of the topic of inequality, that may not be exactly how the general public thinks. Uh, in fact, whereas uh, scholarly work documents the reality of growing inequalities, the empirical record is much less clear on whether people are getting increasingly concerned. 
So uh, consider, for instance, the long trend of worries about economic inequality in the United Kingdom. These are data from the International Social Survey Program fielded in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and then again, uh, just a few years ago. So to get the long run perspective that I'm uh, that I've graphed here for you on this slide, uh, I'm pooling all the survey waves and tracing how successive cohorts of people uh, are thinking about inequality uh, from people born or came came of age really in the 1930s all the way to uh, to people who are coming to age uh, today. Now, through this lens, there is really very little sign that people have grown increasingly concerned over the past 40 years. Um, in fact, if we take it together with the trend in income inequality, it, it appears that as inequality has grown, people have actually become less concerned uh, about it. And meanwhile, they have become more convinced that their society is a meritocracy uh, where people um, uh, deserve uh, their economic position, whether that is a uh, situation of privilege or a situation of, of, of economic precarity. Now, um, these trends are not specific to the United Kingdom. Uh, my research suggests that in all countries and all time periods, except for Poland under communism, um, a majority of the people uh, believes in meritocracy. Um, and moreover, as inequality started growing in the 1980s, which I've marked here with the uh, red vertical line, popular belief in meritocracy uh, has tended to strengthen uh, in, I think, all but three countries. Uh, for those of you interested, I think Austria, Canada, and France are the exception to the, the general trend that we see here. I'm happy to talk more about that uh, in the Q&A. Um, and I should add, we can also see this trend across different social classes. Uh, so this is the UK. And I think what we're seeing here is that belief in meritocracy has uh, increased the most, in fact, uh, among the um, working classes. So, so we find ourselves at, at a time and a place with sort of peak levels of inequality, whereas public worries uh, really remain quite, quite limited. Now, of course, things could change because of the pandemic, uh, and there are some indication that um, in these, uh, quote, unsettled times, uh, to use a phrase or term uh, by, uh, by Anne Switler, um, that, that, you know, people may be becoming more aware of economic disparities, but as I'll argue in what follows, there are also some very good reasons to uh, to temper our expectations of a sudden sudden belief change. Um, for starters, if we look at concerns about inequality in, uh, about inequality in different countries, and we set it off against the actual level of inequality in those same countries, we actually do not find higher levels of concern in more unequal places. We find the opposite, meaning that people in some of the uh, more unequal countries like the United Kingdom, Australia, the US are actually the least concerned. Um, contrast that to countries like France and Italy where more moderate levels of inequality are going together with much higher levels uh, of concern. And when we look at social mobility, uh, we find a similar cluster of countries really uh, including here China, the US and the UK, where people think that there is a lot of social mobility in their society, whereas in fact, these are some of the least socially mobile nations on the planet. So um, in many countries, many places, it would seem perceptions, perceptions of inequality are really um, quite disconnected from reality. People are simply not aware of just how unequal their society is. So to illustrate that further, um, consider Michael Norton and his work, uh, which is a series of cross-national surveys uh, exploring salary differences. So um, when uh, Britons were asked how much a CEO of a major corporation should be making, people said a CEO should make about seven times what a ground level worker does. When then uh, the same people were then asked how much they think a CEO actually makes, people put the income ratio at about 14 to one, thinking that a CEO makes about 14 times what a ground level worker does. Now, the real number is closer to 90 to one. Um, in fact, in the United States, it's more, it's, it's more close, uh, closer to like 350 
to one, which of course is quite far removed from what most people would like it to be. But crucially, it's also really quite far removed from what most people think uh, it is. Um, we can draw some other work. Uh, Bill Franco's work in the US, for instance, shows that these misperceptions really also extend to what people believe about the trend and development of inequality. So this trend grow, uh, uh, this graph shows the actual um, changing income share of the very rich uh, as well as the poor. Um, and let's compare that to the trend in public opinion about whether people think that the economic gap has widened. So observe that there's virtually no relationship uh, between perception and reality here. People really don't have a good understanding of the facts. So um, if the problem is all about misperceptions, how about just providing people with better information? Now, that's exactly what a, a number of recent survey experiments, my, my own included, um, has, has tried to, to do. Um, and kind of notwithstanding, I think, the important insights that this body of research has, has generated, has produced, the, the findings really give us, give us reason to pause. There are some studies that find that when you correct people's misperceptions, it raises their concerns, as expected. Um, there's other studies, however, uh, that find that um, um, you, know, you can heighten people's concerns, but it doesn't really affect people's policy preferences when you correct their misperceptions. So their policy preferences are, are more um, immutable and stable. And, and don't really uh, respond to, uh, to uh, your, your correction of their misperceptions. And other studies even find that when you tell people about the actual level of inequality, it may lead them to sort of upwardly adjust their, their tolerance for inequality. It kind of normalizes inequality for them. So I think we can safely conclude that, you know, misinformation and misperceptions are likely to be part of, of, the, of the situation here or, or the problem, if you will. Uh, but it doesn't really quite tell the full story. Now, another approach to the question of why people aren't more upset about inequality uh, focuses on ideology, uh, cultural narratives. Um, in short, the idea is that people may be unconcerned, not just because they do not know, but because they do not mind. Um, such would be true when people explain economic inequality as the result of a meritocratic process. Now, um, social psychologists posit that everyone really has an interest in um, believing in meritocracy or it's a lot easier to accept that some people are just lazy or untalented than having to cope with the whole of society being unjust and unfair and you being um, implicit in that injustice. Um, sociologists and political scientists um, uh, tend to sort of focus on um, how elites reproduce this meritocratic narrative. Um, their, you know, privileged position in society, of course, is a lot easier to maintain and legitimize if they can draw on um, a narrative like meritocracy that justifies their position, their advantages, uh, etc. And again, I believe this really is also an important part of the story. But what's really missing from both of the, you know, well, both the explanation um, that that I've currently suggested and the misinformation perspective is an answer to the question, why are people in more unequal countries more believing uh, in, in, in meritocracy? So in work I did uh, at, at the IAI actually a few years ago, I've described how um, higher levels of inequality go hand in hand with stronger popular belief in meritocracy, as well as weaker belief uh, in uh, structural causes of inequality. And this is, this is true across social classes. And also, which gets a little bit closer to the sort of causal argument, um, we also see evidence that when countries grow more unequal over time, citizens in tend to become more believing in meritocracy, not less believing, but more believing in meritocracy as their society becomes more unequal. So I think that really leads to the question, what is it about inequality and growing inequality in particular that makes people more accepting of it? And um, to solve that puzzle, I argue um, it requires that we take a closer look at exactly how um, a social inequality impacts society, um, where misperceptions come from and originate, and why people continue to hold these, these meritocratic beliefs. 
to get there, um, I think we need to ask and, and see just how economic inequality is shaping the context in which people are learning about their society. Specifically, how have some 40 years of growing inequality uh, really kind of shaped and reshaped our social lives, that the networks are part of, our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces. And what I'm arguing is that the um, sort of inequality, growing levels of inequality increases the gap between rich and poor, um, not just financially speaking, but, but socially, meaning that rich and poor increasingly live their lives in, in separate workplaces, in separate schools, in separate neighborhoods, and also befriend and, and date and marry people uh, only from within their own socioeconomic circles. Uh, now, that is an empirical claim, of course, and I've begun to, to study uh, with my former students at Harvard what the trends look like in the United States. So what we did is an, sort of make an inventory of research from across the social sciences, looking at research in sociology, of course, uh, but also research in demography, economics, network science, uh, in order to paint a picture of um, overtime changes in socioeconomic segregation um, as um, um, inequality has grown over this, this same time period. So we find that as inequality grows uh, between the 1980s mostly and, and the 2010s, we see that neighborhood segregation uh, is also growing quite a bit. Um, school segregation uh, is increasing uh, enormously. Uh, we see um, um, rising income segregation between workplaces, uh, we see growing rates of network homophily, uh, which is the extent to which people draw their friends from the same economic circles. And uh, last, we also see increasing uh, homogamy, specifically uh, people's tendency to marry within their own income brackets and within their own uh, sort of educational level. So really across all these domains of life, uh, we find evidence of increasing levels of inequality having gone hand in hand with a growing distance, a growing segregation between rich and poor. Um, in ongoing work uh, with colleagues in Sweden and colleagues in the Netherlands, I'm investigating whether or not we're seeing similar trends in, in those countries um, and whether this is just an American phenomenon. Uh, preliminary evidence uh, so far suggests that uh, this is not something that is exclusive uh, to the United States. And I'd be very interested to see uh, if we can uh, document similar trends in the United Kingdom. Um, now, to the extent that economic, economic inequality indeed goes together with uh, residential, educational, workplace segregation, and indeed increases the social divide between rich and poor, I argue that um, highly unequal societies, in fact, provide fewer opportunities for people to cross economic fault lines and to develop an accurate understanding of the nature and causes of inequality in their society. So, it's not that people hold an unwarranted belief in meritocracy, despite the unequal society uh, in which they find themselves. Um, I argue that it's because of their unequal society that they see the world the way that they do. Um, when, when inequality and segregation go hand in hand, inequalities effectively become obscured from people's view. Neither rich or poor can really see the full extent of inequality uh, in their society. And this is what I term the social life of inequality. Um, and uh, to visualize uh, what that looks like, um, these are the kind of settings that I propose are becoming uh, more common. Uh, this is a photograph of Brazil uh, by former Atlantic fellow Johnny Miller uh, in his wonderful but, but also slightly depressing uh, drone photography project titled Unequal Scenes. Um, so we can see how the rich live on the right, uh, the poor live on the left. Uh, this is the um, Santa Fe neighborhood in Mexico City. Again, notice how the spatial distance between rich and poor isn't very uh, large necessarily, but we can see the borders. They're marked, they're rigid. Uh, we can even imagine that people um, really, really lead their lives completely uh, separately. Um, this is a little bit closer from home from where I'm sitting. This is Detroit, Michigan. Um, now, I'm the first to acknowledge that these are extremes, but I do think we can see with um, increasing frequency uh, similar scenes, similar unequal scenes in uh, cities and suburbs uh, across Western countries as well. 
uh, when we look at from our uh, sort of insular social worlds, we simply do not find, do not see, do not encounter uh, much counter evidence to the meritocratic myth that is sold to us by government policies, neoliberalism, but that's also part of so many of the books that we read, the TV shows we watch, the movies we go see, as well as the inspirational stories that, that we tell ourselves and others. Right, so it's really the social life of unequal places, I argue, that makes people less able to recognize it, uh, as well as unwilling to contest it. Now, if all of this uh, diagnosis is correct, then democratic publics may find themselves kind of stuck, uh, stuck in a feedback loop where growing levels of inequality cause a greater disconnect between rich and poor, which in turn strengthens people's belief in meritocracy in the absence of any evidence to the counter. Um, and, um, you know, if we want to break that loop, it would require policies and interventions to create conditions for more interactions across income and educational fault lines to give people an opportunity, an actual opportunity to develop an informed understanding uh, of the nature of inequality as well as the causes of poverty and wealth, which I think is in increasingly lacking uh, from many of our lives um, as is. Now, um, what can we take from all of this for the study, for, the, for research into beliefs about opportunity and mobility? Uh, let me propose um, three implications for scholarship. Uh, ignore the first one, and I don't have time to cover that one. So uh, a need to widen the scope to include more non-Western settings, uh, special attention to how belief um, uh, beliefs about inequality and processes of belief formation and belief change are indeed socially situated. Um, and third, a consideration of alternative methodologies. So um, I believe I'm correct that we still don't know all too much about the context uh, of people's beliefs and, and their policy preferences, which is partly because a lot of the work on this topic um, tends to focus or be situated in the United States and a handful of European countries. Much less is known about how non-Western publics think and feel about inequality, uh, notwithstanding some of the studies that I list here on the slide. So uh, I think a first step is uh, to, uh, you know, we would really do well to widen the lens to capture the true range of international variation. Now, a different and perhaps even more important question is whether belief formation and belief change really look the same in different societies. Now, to find out, we would need to field the same kind of studies in different settings uh, to allow for a, a systematic comparison. So let me give you an example. Um, this is in work that I did with uh, Christopher Hoy. We fielded the same survey experiment in Australia, Indonesia, and Mexico, which are, of course, countries with um, very different levels of inequality, very different trends in economic inequality, uh, but also countries with widely varying cultural narratives uh, about inequality and meritocracy, and really important differences in people's access to factual information through um, unbiased news reporting, etc. So the question was, how does the same information about inequality land um, in different national contexts? So um, our findings suggest that the impact of facts uh, that we provided, um, specifically informing people about actual levels of mobility in their country, and uh, also about how the economic pie is shared um, unevenly, we find that the impact of those facts is highest in uh, the country, Indonesia, where uh, popular belief in meritocracy is strong and access to factual information is more limited. Um, really sort of the, um, you know, where facts likely produce the greatest shock to people's belief system. Uh, so it, it, it really, really rocked Indonesians' belief in meritocracy and it led many people to um, reevaluate their understanding of equal opportunity in their society. Literally the same set of information uh, made much less of a splash in Mexico where uh, poverty and wealth are arguably commonly understood as resulting from things like corruption and other non-meritocratic processes. And then when we fielded our study in Australia, 
uh, we find a pattern that is largely consistent with uh, motivated reasoning, meaning that people, um, they respond to information um, really conditional on their own income position, their own self-interest. So they kind of take from the information uh, what aligns with their own interests. Now, these kind of comparative studies, uh, I believe may yield some, some really important insights into the why and how question of um, when are inequalities successfully uh, contested in some settings uh, and why are they not in others? So to give you some uh, one example, um, uh, take the case of Chile, where uh, following more than a year of mass public protests, uh, new elections were called, uh, which were won by a former student leader, uh, Gabriel Boric, right, uh, on a very, very progressive platform. Now, his victory can be understood as a response to 30 years of neoliberalism, right, which is sort of the, um, the rallying cry of a lot of the protest movement. But um, the timing of the protest and uh, Boric's um, um, political victory are really hard to understand if we just look at the economic trends. Um, at the time that the mass protests were, were kicking off, income levels had reached a peak. Um, the level of income inequality in, in Chile were, uh, was sort of at the lowest point in recent history. And I believe you know, many Latin American countries um, uh, sort of more generally show kind of the reverse trends that we're seeing in the West where, where income inequalities, while still at a high level, tend to be on the decline rather than on the rise. So what disrupted their um, inequality equilibrium, if you will? Um, is there some threshold at which inequality simply becomes too much, uh, where people don't, don't take it anymore? I think these are some of the questions that I think are especially worthwhile to explore. And, and as I'm sure that um, Kiko and others uh, are already exploring in the Latin American and Caribbean inequality review. Um, again, widen the lens. I think we have lots, lots to learn from countries outside of the West. But um, beyond um, comparing between different national contexts, I also believe it's very important, very worthwhile to situate uh, processes of belief formation and belief change uh, more, more locally and um, more situ situationally as well. Uh, much survey research uh, tend to proceed from what is an implicit assumption uh, that beliefs are formed and changed in social isolation, right, as a purely individual process. An alternative account is of people processing information and forming beliefs um, as part of um, social interactions, right? By uh, talking to friends, by arguing with family members, uh, or, or just exchanging views with, with coworkers over the water cooler. Um, so giving a more realistic account of belief formation and belief change might require a different methodology than is typically used. Now, of course, interview studies offer such an alternative. And I think there's much to be learned uh, from qualitative work in general that we cannot learn from, from surveys and quantitative work. Uh, but I believe there, there may, be, may be more yet to learn from going beyond uh, the kind of individual reflections that you can evoke uh, in an interview setting and um, try to really study belief formation in action. Uh, let me let me give you one example. So with colleagues at LSE, uh, spearheaded by Kate Summers, um, uh, supported uh, with grants from Steikert and as well as the III, we have been piloting something called deliberative focus groups. Um, in these groups, we are attempting to create a more naturalistic setting in which a conversation between strangers uh, takes place about the topic of inequality so that we can study how perceptions and beliefs and attitudes may kind of shape up uh, in social interaction. Um, now, key to this methodology is the introduction uh, in the middle of the conversation of uh, particular facts or frames about inequality, and then to see how this changes the ongoing conversation uh, and whether it leads to a different uh, group consensus uh, emerging from that conversation. By bookending the focus group uh, conversation with individual pre and post surveys, we can really see, uh, see and, and, and sort of document belief change in action. 
Another feature of the design uh, includes randomizing the kind of information that people are presented with. Uh, that could be, for instance, highlighting social mobility or the lack thereof. It could be focusing on the excesses of wealth. Uh, it could also be highlighting poverty. And the other thing that we can vary is the composition of the focus group. Uh, either a more or less homogeneous group, uh, like our friends and colleagues tend to be in real life, um, and, and that's increasingly in the case in some countries like I've, like I've shown for, for the United States, or um, something of a more heterogeneous group uh, that really does a better job of reflecting the true diversity uh, in our society, right? So how do conversations perhaps take a different shape, take a different form, have a different dynamic uh, when they're conducted uh, in the context of a homogeneous versus a heterogeneous group of people. Now, uh, before our research was uh, very rudely abrupted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as it has so many aspects of our lives, um, before that, we were bringing together groups of uh, eight or nine strangers um, provided with ample tea and cookies, as you can see here on the slide or a conversation about wealth, poverty, and inequality. Uh, the core part of that group conversation, which was uh, carefully moderated, closely um, uh, following a, a topic guide, uh, was a group task. And you can see that group task already here on the picture. So we asked participants in small groups of two or three uh, to use Lego blocks to try and build the income and wealth distribution in the United Kingdom. Uh, and that would result in something like you see here, um, or a uh, more equal distribution like this one, um, oh, or something that is really sort of stratospherically uneven, uh, like we see here on, on the slide. Now, after participants were done, uh, kind of with their Lego blocks, uh, which was a process of deliberation between group members, right? Um, we would ask them to explain their approach. Uh, and only then would we reveal the, tree, the true or real or factual distribution of income and wealth in the United Kingdom. Now, um, our findings uh, are necessarily preliminary, but I think our methodology already led us to recognize a couple of things that I wanted to share with you today. The first thing is that we learned that participants took very different strategies to arrive at their income or wealth distribution. Uh, some groups would kind of construct income from the ground up, uh, debating how much people in different professions make or how much a typical family owns in assets, whereas others took more of a macro perspective, thinking of wealth uh, or, or income as a, as a pie that is shared unevenly. So how people kind of construct inequality really differed or varied from group to group and really shaped how they pictured economic disparities. Uh, another insight that we gained is that people's beliefs and attitudes were frequently activated by another person's comment or response. So for instance, when once someone described income and wealth in sort of zero sum terms, others would draw on that notion to formulate their own views, uh, right? So this is a social process, obviously, that we're all subject to in our everyday lives uh, that is really, really hard to capture in survey data. So um, I think that really speaks to uh, taking an approach like this. Also, for many people, inequality was something that was inherently uh, relational uh, and, and often temporal as well. Uh, they would preface their views by saying, as a father, as a woman, as a student. Um, and some of the older participants would reflect on the fact that income and wealth really meant different things at different stages of their life. And last, um, returning to the Lego exercise, when we asked people to build their distributions of income and wealth, we found that uh, participants often arrived at a distribution that very much mirrored the real distribution in the United Kingdom. In fact, some of the um, Lego block constructions were more unequal uh, than income and wealth are divided or distributed in the United Kingdom today. So in other words, we didn't actually find as much evidence of misperceptions as we had previously assumed. Now, whether this reflects the social interactive aspect of the exercise, uh, whether um, uh, the exercise kind of renders inequalities more tangible and, in, and intuitive, uh, that I cannot say with certainty, nor can we rule out that this perhaps, this particular finding may be a reflection of our London-based sample. Um, 
but with, whichever it is, I think it underscores the importance of considering how beliefs um, and how um, belief formation really is socially situated, as well as to um, be kind of conscientious and, and reflective in thinking about the pros and cons of the particular methodology uh, that we deploy uh, and not necessarily go for the standard approach like, um, like the survey or the interview. All right, let me wrap up, uh, conclude. Um, what I've done is I've offered a diagnosis of why people are not as worried about inequality and mobility as uh, one may think. Uh, namely, um, I have made the case that uh, greater inequality is going hand in hand with a growing uh, separation and segregation between rich and poor, uh, such that they have become increasingly disconnected from one another and leading sort of insular um, lives. From that follows the uh, more or less paradoxical situation, I would say, that we find ourselves in, uh, where in many countries, rising levels of inequality do not lead to public consternation because people are, are less exposed to it in their daily lives. Comparing or, or considering the implications for research, I've made a case for looking at how processes of belief formation and change are indeed socially situated. Um, and I've called for a widening of the empirical lens to include uh, non-Western settings and perspectives and to consider alternative methodologies for studying uh, belief formation in action. Uh, so um, yeah, I hope that this diagnosis and these suggestions will provide some food for thought. I'm gonna end there. Uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you'd like to learn more about my ongoing work or have ideas for collaboration, um, et cetera. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, Zia, would you like to share your screen and respond? Okay, so um, I will perhaps at the beginning precise that I prepared the discussion based on the papers that uh, um, so Johnson sent to me. So it's based on these two paper and I think uh, all of you have heard uh, the most of the content in these two paper and of course the part of the new experience, new uh, methodological um, experience that uh, Johnson has had in his talk. So uh, I will uh, ask questions then based on these two papers. So the first paper I will uh, name it in the paper inequality paper. So I just write here to be clear that when later I talk about these two paper, we know which paper I'm talking about. So the second one, I will just talk about the international comparison paper. And uh, these two paper are very interesting for me, especially and myself work on uh, meritocratic uh, belief. And I work especially on the uh, Chinese uh, national college, in, uh, college entrance examination in China. So that is the big, we can say, uh, meritocratic machine. And especially uh, it's very powerful in the socialization process for Chinese students. And I try to make my discussion uh, useful uh, to and interesting to Johnson as well. And I just think firstly, uh, perhaps it's useful to just to talk about my perception of these two paper. And I think the most interesting part for me is firstly, it's um, uh, these two paper are um, using uh, quantitative method. And uh, the first one really test the and the major the uh, relation between the belief of hard work and uh, the inequality of income. So uh, this is a paper that can really prove there is a co-variation between the belief in hard work and uh, the income inequality in uh, OC, uh, OCD countries. And uh, that means uh, where more people believe in hard work make people advancing career, there is more national inequality of income in these countries. So these are perhaps just a, a little bit more uh, detailed information that I picked from a paper that can help us to think better about um, the question that uh, Jonathan asked in his talk. And the second thing I think very interesting, uh, so more in the second paper is to show the power of information uh, on the meritocratic belief. So it's just like Jonathan talk, 
the, about this misperception of uh, inequality in different countries. And in this uh, study, when we show people the correct uh, information about inequality, in fact, people change uh, a little their uh, opinion, of course, according to countries. So I think that is very interesting, especially considering the powerful and the long process of uh, socialization that people um, uh, go through uh, during their uh, academic uh, uh, experience. And um, so these are two points that I think very interesting. And here comes from the question. So there are main uh, two questions that I want to ask to Jonathan. Firstly is uh, how can we define merit solely by hard work? Uh, because in fact, in the first paper and in, in this chart that Jonathan just showed us during his job, uh, during his talk, uh, here, the belief in meritocracy, uh, Jonathan presides in the paper that uh, he's talking about hard work um, only. So uh, it's not exactly what we uh, heard by meritocracy in more general way. And of course, I believe this is, an, uh, it, this is a choice, it's a uh, methodological choice. So this question continued by for what interests we define uh, merits uh, only by hard work. And the second question is uh, more about this international perspective. Uh, it's very interesting to make international comparison, but uh, how we can compare different country when probably uh, the uh, idea, the main idea of talent and effort that means to uh, part of the meritocracy is defined, evaluated, and so shaped by uh, very differently by uh, educational system in different country. And so how we can take into consideration this impact of the international system uh, in this international comparison. So I think about this question because by reading the second paper, um, the international uh, comparison paper, uh, I realized that in these three countries that um, Jonathan and his co-author choose to uh, compare, uh, the first the two countries, Australia and Mexico, have only attitude examination to go to university, whereas uh, Indonesia have a uh, national college entrance examination. That means this is an examination, uh, compare standardized examination, compare everyone, and kind of uh, give a uh, positional uh, ranking to everyone. So I think this probably produce very different experience in their um, schooling uh, experience and have different uh, process of the social socialization about meritocratic belief as well. And if this uh, precept question uh, interests me, it's because I uh, introduced myself that I study on the college entrance examination in China. So we call that the Gaokao. So in my research, I find out that the, uh, during the preparation of this uh, examination, basically we construct the ranking and that ends on subjective hierarchy, uh, individual hierarchy by two concepts. Firstly is the uh, competence and secondly is effort. So uh, this, we can say these two part of the uh, meritocracy. And by competence, this is more uh, and um, work done by teachers. So a teacher will comment on uh, exam result uh, for the whole class or individually, and to uh, get some information about students have or have not a certain competence. And the other side, uh, the evaluation directly made by exam are believed as a, an evaluation of efforts. That means everyone, if we make efforts, we can have a uh, very high score in uh, examinations. So I think this perhaps can give us an idea how to break uh, what Jonathan calls the loop uh, between um, um, belief in meritocracy and inequality and then segregation. Because in my uh, study, I find out that in fact, teacher can take an active role to comment differently uh, or to just to change their way to distribute competence because after all this competence is not 
directly uh, considered as uh, the result of examination. It's more about a subjective construction of the hierarchy. And uh, from this uh, paper, I can uh, from my study, I try to show that by competence, it's just a uh, distribution of symbolic goods. That means distribution of a subjective position in the in the hierarchy. And my research is based on an ethnography in different high school in China, and um, uh, just uh, uh, and by observing uh, students preparing uh, examination. So that can uh, explain why uh, perhaps there's difference uh, in approach. And from the same approach, I can um, recommend the study of uh, Paul Pasquali, who studied uh, preparation for uh, uh, examination to get into uh, uh, a the elite school in France. And uh, Mira Damos uh, did the same uh, kind of study uh, about uh, this uh, preparation to elite school as well. And all that can uh, illustrate probably better how um, this experience and how this uh, socialization uh, of uh, meritocracy uh, can uh, be different and can define differently the meaning of merit in different system. Um, and in uh, Jonathan's paper, he talked more about believing in meritocracy. Uh, that is, in fact, an, a word um, in, uh, invented by uh, Michael Young, so uh, everyone know that. And uh, the thing is, uh, by define meritocracy, uh, he um, narrowed down uh, a lot the meaning of merit. So merit basically is just a moral concept that can uh, embrace a lot of different uh, meaning in different society, but by defining meritocracy, he includes only what he called intelligence. That means knowledge used in school, uh, knowledge, yeah, useful knowledge in school and uh, effort. And uh, when he uh, tried to create this word, he says that um, meritocracy is just another word uh, with uh, aristocracy. So according to him, it's just exactly the same word. And that means the power should be given to the best. So that's uh, how me to go back to my question. So we, how can we define the best uh, only by those who work the first, work the most, or in which condition we can say that, in which context we can say that, uh, or otherwise by saying that what we imply in fact. I think that should be very interesting. And I will just go very quickly. So um, I think all the, these two questions uh, is meant to uh, reconsider comparative studies about meritocracy. And uh, that means we uh, perhaps should ask question uh, at the beginning about what we are really studying. Uh, are we studying the practice uh, in justification and social justice? or are we studying practice in evaluation of merit, or are we studying the practice in distribution and retribution? And I'm thinking about this question uh, from different studies. Uh, well, I just tried to give press more information about studies made in France. So for example, uh, Elise Dauret that Johnson uh, quoted as well in his study, uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, research, uh, give a research about the representation of merit. So for example, she find out that for a lot of people, just the uh, year um, passed um, in, uh, on uh, one job or a position could be a merit as well. So we can probably um, de define more broadly the merit by just uh, um, asking people what are merit uh, for them. And uh, Nicolas Schaff studied about evaluative practice of uh, merit in different country. For example, he shows that in uh, England, uh, people try to uh, include uh, non-academic merit into consideration, whereas in uh, North uh, European countries, they think we should uh, include uh, non-meritocratic uh, non principles into evaluation uh, to put forward uh, equality. 
And uh, the third example, I want to uh, show how we can uh, uh, keep, have different approach of meritocracy is the study of Pablo uh, Blinstein. In fact, he show how we change changed consideration in uh, meritocracy from um, at the beginning, it's more important to put forward talent and then it's more important to put forward efforts uh, during an historical period in China. Uh, so uh, around um, uh, 19, uh, 1920. So I think all that are interesting way uh, to uh, understand better what is meritocracy and what we are talking about when we are talking about meritocracy. And uh, at the end, uh, I just want to uh, perhaps uh, put these two charts together. So the one, the first one is what Jameson uh, showed in his paper. And uh, he says from 1980, there is an uh, uh, increasing uh, belief in meritocracy. And I just see there's a lot of countries begin at 1990. And from the chart uh, that I just take from uh, Ingram, we can say from 1990, there is an, uh, a strong increasing uh, tendency of uh, the use of the word meritocracy as well. So I'm asking, it's more, we are more talking about meritocracy or uh, neoliberalism, because uh, if we only talk about hard work, uh, it's, uh, is it neoliberalism can encourage, uh, that is encouraging hard work by uh, orientating uh, retribution principles and practice in uh, different societies. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much to you both, Jonathan and Ziu, so much for your insightful presentations. I will now open the floor to questions from the audience. To the audience, uh, please use the raise hand function to pose your question or paste your question into the chat. If you could state your, state your name and affiliation, that would be lovely. Maybe as people are thinking about questions, uh, Jonathan, would you like to take two or three minutes or so to comment on serious comments? Yeah, no, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll just respond and um, and please anyone interrupt me or uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll take your questions. Uh, but happy to uh, sort of uh, talk, talk us through. Uh, um, so your first question, do you, uh, I mean, all your questions are, are, are super helpful and uh, I really appreciate them. Your first question about how we define merit is, is a great one, of course. Um, and, and for the purpose of this research project, as many other researchers, I have looked only at the extent to which people it's, uh, think it's hard work that explains success in society rather than a whole lit list or set of other factors, such as how wealthy your parents are or your skin color, your gender. Uh, so we tend to think about hard work as sort of an individual factor versus things that are uh, structural or without or beyond our control. And that's kind of like what a lot of research has been drawn, drawing on. And that really comes from the fact that this is a survey that's been launched in the 1980s, repeated so many times. So it gives us this excellent sort of basis for um, uh, looking at time, time trends, right? Um, but uh, of course, if you want to uh, really get sort of a better comprehensive understanding of how people understand, how, how people think about uh, the, the, these terms and concepts, and I think uh, you want to take a, a more qualitative approach, and that will probably indeed uh, lead to different conceptions of, of what constitutes merit. Uh, so actually, for instance, I'm working with a student um, here who is doing interviews with Chinese students who went to the United States for their graduate studies. And she found that in her interviews, when she asked uh, people about whether they believe um, things are meritocratic or not, there was a lot of sort of cultural confusion about what that even means. And um, it, to kind of go back to that formula, right? Michael Young's formula of merit equals intelligence plus effort. Uh, in my, my students' interviews, um, um, she, she kind of arrived at something a little bit different, it, which she says better captures the uh, the way that that a lot of these highly educated Chinese students are understanding things, and that is um, there is your intelligence, there is effort, but it's all about converting that into ability. Um, so some people are really really smart, but they're not really great at taking tests, for instance. So there's basically another like an A or something missing from that formula if you really want to capture how they understand 
uh, the process that is sort of producing merit. So I think that was a really insightful uh, lesson that I learned from her work. Uh, but I know there's a lot of other work on this topic um, um, in France, Annabelle Luge, uh, of course, and uh, Marie de Roubala and, and Agnes Mazant have been working on this for forever. Um, so there, I know there's a lot of really interesting uh, sort of cross-country comparisons on this on this topic. Um, let me pause to see if there's any questions. Otherwise, I'll I'll continue. There is a question from Fiona. Close yours. Uh -huh. Right. Um, so uh, thanks so much. Um, I was wondering, so you, you said that uh, homogenous environments would um, make people uh, more unconcerned about um, inequality and more um, prone to believing in meritocracy. But I'm wondering whether, I'm, I'm wondering how homogenous these um, environments would be, because um, from the social mobility literature, it's said that um, when there are some examples of people who've made it to the top without having had um, the advantages that other had, that actually um, in, yeah, creates the conditions whereby these meritocratic narratives are more believable. So I'm wondering if there's something about that as well. Um, so how, how would you explain that more homogenous uh, environments lead to stronger beliefs in meritocracy? Yeah, great point. And to, to, to sort of to the point of, um, of mobility, yeah, I think there's two sides to that. Um, one is I, actually, I, I just published a paper um, looking at how people's own social mobility experience, how that um, um, is, is associated with their belief in meritocracy. And I find that people who are upwardly mobile are more believing in meritocracy, which, uh, which, which could be two things, right? It could be them kind of like justifying their own success, but it could also be that they have experience, they've lived the meritocratic dream, right? So why wouldn't they be believing in it? Um, but, and that's really important, I find that downward mobility, so people were kind of like experience social falling, it doesn't necessarily affect their belief in meritocracy, right? So it could be that just a small number of people experiencing uh, upward mobility may be sufficient sort of for a, a group or a population to, to continue believing in meritocracy. So I think that's, that maybe speaks to, to your point. Um, but I, I, I think this, the other thing that you were, you were alluding to here is that, um, it's these very visible success stories um, that are uh, that we may observe, but it's also something that is uh, presented to us or kind of thrown at us through, um, you know, whatever on Instagram and in news reporting and in TV shows, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of sort of meritocratic narratives out there in, in many countries. And I don't think this is just a Western phenomenon. I think it's actually it's extended quite a bit, even though the origin perhaps is uh, countries like the United States. Um, but it's kind of, it's everywhere, right? So I think the, the, the point really becomes um, what opportunities do people have to experience and be exposed to counter narratives, right? To be experienced, to, to experience and see structural inequality in action. And that's where I believe that if you're surrounded with people who share a similar um, degree of success, if you will, similar income position, certain educational level, you're just not as aware of the advantages that you're faced, that, you're, that you all have, or the disadvantages that everyone around you also shares, uh, than you would if you were to be in a more integrated uh, setting. Thank you, Jonathan. We have a question from Ti Xiang. Oh, hello. Hi. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, I have two um, perhaps more sort of wide um, questions. I think the first one is, I wonder whether you encountered the concept of opportunities or in the studies and in research projects that you've done and in this meritocratic process, how uh, people um, interpreted or viewed their opportunities or whether that's come up at all. Um, I think any any perspective will be interesting to, to talk to just to for out of curiosity. And the second one is um, um, what sort of pathways uh, do you think really lends um, a constructive sort of a perspective for civil society or for any sort of a social intervention to deal with inequality? 
um, out of this uh, mer meritocratic um, process. Uh, yeah, that's all, two questions and um, uh, any perspective would be interesting to know. Thank you. Thanks for those excellent questions. And I can already tell I'm going to be falling woefully short of, 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 of answering them sort of satisfactorily. To the first point, I mean, the problem is that in a lot of this research, we are drawing on quantitative data, uh, except for that last project, which we started, but which is still in this preliminary phase, unfortunately. Um, and in that, in that kind of, when you ask people questions about meritocracy or about success, uh, you're kind of asking two things at the same time. You're asking them to explain um, people who, who are sort of at the top or, or at the lower ends of the social ladder and why they got to where they are. And you're asking them about uh, opportunity for, um, uh, for to be successful, you know, yourself or others. And all of that is kind of captured in the same kind of questions that are typically drawn on. So I think it's, a, it's an important distinction that uh, I, I would say hasn't, hasn't always been made in research. And I think my own research uh, is also um, um, you know, also suffers from that shortcoming. Um, as it comes to interventions to deal with inequality, yeah, so my perspective clearly, as you could tell, is that I think when people are not aware of the level of inequality in our society, or when they think of it uh, through a, you know, very meritocratic lens, I don't think you're going to be getting much popular support to uh, policies, you know, political interventions, et cetera, to do anything about it. So I think the first step really is to get people to have a more realistic, a more, a more direct, uh, better understanding of, of the societies in which they live. And, and that's something that, of course, reflects, unfortunately, a lot of the personal and individual choices that people make, where to settle, what neighborhoods to live in, where to send your kids to school. Uh, what kind of work to uh, workplace to seek out, but also increasingly, I, I would argue, or I hypothesize, I guess, um, who you date and who you befriend, and and in all those realms, uh, I think there's a there's a worry that I have of of growing insulation rather than integration. Uh, so that will be a first thing that I think is is really important to recognize. So our own individual responsibility in that respect, but then of course also, I mean who we befriend in school, for instance, is, um, you know, we, we can only befriend people who are in the same school or same classrooms, right, or the same context, live in the same neighborhoods as we do, right? So there's a lot that local government and national governments can do to uh, really make an effort to uh, desegregate, not just ethnically and racially, but economically desegregate and integrate uh, schools and neighborhoods. And that kind of sort of Institutional interventions, I think, are likely to produce much more of an effect than just sort of throwing information at, at people, because information only registered to a certain extent, uh, and I think is also filtered through the prism of our own experiences, right? So when information really clashes with our experiences, it's, uh, not everybody is going to take it at face value. Yeah, I have a question as well, actually. Um, so I work on social mobility, uh, and we spoke a little bit about that and the meritocracy beliefs, especially of those people who experience a somewhat long range social mobility, right? Um, I wonder if there's something interesting on that um, for people who are the result of microclass reproduction, i.e. people that end up in the exact same occupations as their parents, for example. So that could be doctors whose parents already were doctors or lawyers whose parents who, uh, already were lawyers. Um, I wonder how meritocracy beliefs work for these people. Um, and I don't know if there's been research on that already. If not, I might contribute to this. <laughs> um, because, I mean, it might be hard to, you know, for them to exclusively attribute their success to their own merits, right? Um, because there's definitely some inherited capital. Um, Jonathan, I do wonder if there's anything that you've already explored or ever took into consideration when it comes to this group of people. I mean, to be fair, not really. My my former mentor at the University of Amsterdam is Herman uh, van der Verforst, and he, he worked on this in this area a lot, documenting these kind of uh, micro um, mobility or lack of mobility, right? The stability kind of uh, uh, patterns. Uh, and um, uh, I think he also has a growing interest in these kind of questions, but I don't think he's pursued it. I haven't really, no, I think those are really interesting cases, but where indeed it becomes even harder to kind of justify your success as meritocratic, right? When it's so clear that your network and who you know is part of it and 
um, and and also th there isn't an well yeah I think stability is also is always interesting like intergenerational kind of stability and I know that other people like Luna Glucksberg at the, um, uh, at the center right has a, at the institute has done some terrific work on the extent to which people go to to uh, to try to maintain their status intergenerationally. Um, there's a lot of hard work that goes into uh, sort of social reproduction. So uh, no, I would encourage you to pursue these questions. I don't, I don't have much, much to offer. Right. Yeah. Because I've, um, I don't know if there are any more questions. Otherwise, I can say one or two more things. Because I work on on on, on lawyers, right? And um, I've done this the survey, which around like three thousand lawyers uh, replied to, and um, there is. You know, definitely evidence for some sort of microclass reproduction taking place. Although I believe now exploring in the qualitative interviews that I'll do in the future, I don't think people will be open about saying like, "Oh, yeah, obviously this is because of my networks and so on and so forth." Because there is a survey question about has any of your parents ever worked in a legal occupation, which a lot a lot of people replied yes to. But the question after that, to what extent do you believe did that, that? You know. Um, um, also had an impact on your own career decision. Not everybody said a lot, you know. So I think the assumption would be people hate hearing, you know, that they are not entirely responsible for their own success in a way. Yeah. So my hunch would be that um, a lot of it hinges on what people's references are, right? So if everyone in their setting is kind of similarly um socially stable um and then they may have completely normalized the fact that their parents were solidly middle class and prepared them for where they are etc and they think it's arbitrary whether they became doctors or lawyers or whatever but you know if people are growing up in a much more heterogeneous setting uh with different kind of reference points uh then they may actually show some awareness of of the privilege that they had and other people lacked um um, um Katrina Hecht, uh, who also uh, was a was a postdoc at uh, no PhD student at uh, at at the institute, uh, she did some really interesting work and, and published uh, on this on this kind of point recently, where she interviewed um, people working in finance in London, and and she shows how people making ludicrous amounts of money. Uh, don't consider themselves to be rich, uh, don't think that that's a lot of money because they're comparing themselves to people who are just sort of sort of, you know, they're looking up um, rather than looking down and and their sort of relatively isolated, insulated sort of social worlds really, really play a big part in uh, their underestimation of their own privileges and advantages. Yeah, right. um, so it'd be really interesting to explore. Yeah, it's all these high net worth individuals, right, um, that have a more relational understanding of their own merits. Yeah, and I can perhaps just uh, add one sentence to this very interesting question uh, that make, it, make me think about the study uh, of Pablo uh, Bistein as well, because he studied not only the contemporary period, but uh, as well medieval period of China. And he shows that if for that period, people think uh, young people come from very rich, family are the best is because they are the only one who can receive education uh, because their family can build a school for them and to get them educated so they don't really think that so uh, at the beginning it's not a uh, question about inequality it's only a question about to have the better person to do the job so i think uh so his argument is today is the same um way of thinking for people as well so even though this uh, people just do the same job as their parents, but they could be still have this meritocratic thinking because they are the best people to do the job. They still have the best quality, uh, quantitative education uh, for for the different uh, professions. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, Fiona, would you like to add something? In relation to this um, sort of um, group of reference, maybe that would um, appear in your focus groups in your um, whether they are heterogeneous or homogeneous um, how people uh, talk about their privilege if there have been any I, I would be really curious to know more about this because I ran some um, discussion groups with um, well educational elites um, and when they it was a homogeneous group and they started saying how privileged people like us are, but then 
not anything else. I mean, we are privileged. However, the system is still kind of fair. <laughs> so there was a recognition of privilege, but it didn't actually turn into being uh, concerned about inequalities, at least that's how I interpret it. So I, I'm wondering if you're observing that with income as well, if there's any sort of recognition of being part of an income group and how that affects people's um, I don't know, beliefs in meritocracy? Yeah, um, no, great question. So our pilot study was uh, basically we had to pause it at the point where we didn't have the opportunity yet to include that kind of randomization. We, we had different informational treatments sort of injected into the focus group setting, uh, but we didn't uh, get to systematically compare uh, across homogeneous versus heterogeneous uh, groups. I did um, have some, some thesis students uh, in the last couple of years who've done these focus groups in the Netherlands and in Bulgaria, different settings. And um, yeah, what they did is they, they looked at very homogeneously poor and homogeneously rich groups and compared that. I felt that was very interesting as well. But um, um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's an open question. And I, I mean, there's a clear hypothesis that follows from my work, of course. But uh, yeah, we, we should really, really see if that's um, if that pans out in that exact way or, or if it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, part, of course, what you're also getting to getting at perhaps is, um, you know, there is like a deep actual awareness of your privileges, I think is slightly distinct from sort of more of a signaling uh, to privilege, right? That, that That is socially desirable and such, and such right? So uh, that's also something that, um, yeah, may, may come out very differently in, in more heterogeneous groups, I would expect, yeah.